All right. So um, let's read tonight. Let's go into our word and read. And so let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 um, through 6. It says, therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, condemning ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Verse three. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost and whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. We're talking about Satan here. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And so verse five says, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord and ourselves, your servants for Jesus's sake, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so in verse one through T, uh, one through T, one through two, we see that Paul is preaching the gospel boldly. Okay. We see here that Paul is preaching the gospel boldly. This is Paul talking. And so when Paul considered how great his call was, it gave him the heart to face all of his difficulties. And so when you understand the call that God has placed upon your life, okay, then you will have the heart to be able to face any, any difficulty that comes your way because you'll understand that God is with you in this call. God is with you as he has called you, okay? And so oftentimes we lose heart because we do not take into consideration how great the call is on our lives. I'm gonna say that again. Oftentimes we lose heart, okay? We faint, we lose heart, we become, uh, we become uh, discouraged, we become distracted, all of that stuff because we do not take into consideration the call that is on our lives. How many of you know that God has called each and every one of us to do something in the kingdom of God? Even if that call for you is simply just to keep the bathrooms clean and to be a servant, to stand at the door and be an usher, whatever, even if it's just to share the gospel when you're in the grocery store, all of us have been called to do something. And so when you reach um, or research in the Greek, the phrase lose heart, we find that it speaks of the faint hearted. Okay. So when you see the term to lose heart in this context, it's speaking of those who are faint at heart, who have, who are faint hearted. And so it says one who is a coward. And it also means one who lacks courage, one who is a coward, and one who lacks courage. And so um, I love reading and um, reading the uh, different things that Charles uh, Spurgeon has said, which is a Bible scholar. And he says a preacher should either speak in God's name or he, should hold, or he or she should hold his tongue. For if God has not given you a message, you might as well go lay down somewhere because what you have to say does not matter. So in other words, we are not to preach or say anything that God has not already said in his word. The Bible tells us that we're not supposed to add to the word of God and we're not supposed to take away. Really, where the Bible is silent, we're supposed to be silent. And so if you have not been given something by God to speak, then it's best that you hold your tongue. And so he says here, he says, but if God has given you a message to speak, then you are to speak loud for he has called you to, the, to be the mouth of God. And so cry loud, spare not. So Paul preached with all humility. All right. He was humble. Look at these characteristics. He preached with humility. He was humble. He knew that his call to ministry was not by his own works, but it was by mercy. And so if you have been called to ministry, if you have been called anywhere in the uh, to do anything in the word of God pertaining to an, an assignment or a call, then you have been called not by your own works. There's nothing you can do. There's no work that you can do to justify your call, but it's simply by the mercy of God that he has chosen to use you and he has called you to that place. So we have to understand that as Christians, you and I, as Christians, as preachers, as teachers, as, as uh, people of God, people that love the Lord, um, that we stand in God's presence and guess what? He hears everything. As we are standing in his presence, he hears everything. 
he has eyes that sees everywhere. He has ears that can hear everything all at the same time. And so when we tell people about Christ, we have to make sure that we do not change the message. It's very important that when you are teaching the word of God, when you are sharing the word of God, when you are witnessing to somebody pertaining to the word of God, that you do not change the message. That's And that's why I share with you guys all the time. I teach you all the time. It's very important for you to understand the context of um, what you're teaching, what you're sharing, what you're talking about, because, and we're gonna see further in this lesson that the people that are not walking upright before the Lord, people that um, look, cause there's a lot of people today that search scripture just to combat scripture. There's a lot of people that search scripture or that read the Bible just to be able to fight the commandments of God, just to be able to fight preachers or teachers and to be able to say, well, that's not what the word says. The word says this. And so all people don't do that. Some people genuinely want to know, but there are some people that do fight the word of God. And so what they'll do is, um, They'll, they'll take the word of God and they'll take it out of context, okay? And so we have to make sure that when we're preaching this, we dig deep. We have to make sure that we're understanding, like we learned in the um, class the other night when Minister Marks, when she was teaching how to study the word of God, we have to ask those questions when we study. Who was the word talking about? Who, what? What was it talking about? When did this take place in the word of God? When did it take place? What era? What dispensation? Um, what, what, uh, what city were they in? What culture were they talking to? Who, what, when, where, why, how? All of those questions come into play when you're reading a text because you can simply read a text and it's specifically talking to one group of people, but if you don't understand who that group of people was and why it was specifically spoke to them at that time, we can take that word and we can we can take that word and hold people to that word and hold it against them when it had nothing to do with them. For instance, I'll give you an example here in this same book in Corinthians, Paul was telling the women in the church that they had to be silent in the church. And so some people have took that and they have made it a doctrine and they say, well, the Bible says that just women are not supposed to preach. Women are supposed to be silent in the church. Women are not supposed to do anything in the church, but that's not what it meant. He was talking to the Corinthians. He was talking to the Corinthians in that time. Why did he tell them that women were supposed to be silent in the church? He told them that because during that time, they had just came out of a dispensation. They had just came out of an era where, where people, where women were not even allowed in the church. It was just men. And so now they just started allowing women to come into the house of God. And so men had already been studying all this time. They had already been uh, hearing the preached word all of this time. They had been getting the understanding, the revelation, the knowledge of the word of God during this time. And so now here it goes all of these women are allowed to come to the church and i'm paraphrasing but they were sitting there with their husbands and the word of god is being taught and is being preached and they're amazed and they're like okay well what does that mean what does this mean uh, oh he said that okay what does that mean and so all of these people are talking at the same time while the preacher's trying to talk and it became a disruption it became a distraction and so paul said to them look men wives be silent in the church women be silent in the church and husbands you teach your wives at home so in other words we don't have time to discuss it here it's causing too much of a distraction it's causing too much of a disruption but when you get home you share it with them and teach them there because you guys already have the knowledge you already have to understand it but it wasn't for us to carry that on as a law today that's why it's important. We cannot change the message. And so I think I thank God for Minister Angela when she was sharing that last week with you guys, because it confirmed what I've always shared is when you read the Bible. And that's why you need to get a Bible that um, I'm not saying you need to, but it would be helpful to get a Bible that already shares some of that stuff with you. So when you start reading different chapters in the Bible or different books in the Bible, you can go to the beginning of that book and you can see the history. OK, who who wrote this? Paul wrote it. OK, why did he write it? Who was he talking to? What's the history? Where were they located during that time? Remember, where were they located during that time? So that you can understand the culture. So when you start diving into the word, you understand completely who they are talking to. So we cannot change the message. We cannot distort it in any way, in any order to please others. We cannot change this message to please people. Even if your own family members are walking contrary to the word of God. Yes, our family touches our heart. They're near and dear to our heart. They rub us in a soft way, right? You know, normally in life, you're willing to bend more so for your family members than you are for anybody else. But when it comes to the word of God, this word does not change. So in other words, I'll use this because this is what the people like to use. But even like, for instance, I'll use it, uh, homosexuality as an example. If I have somebody in my family that's a homosexual, which this has happened, I have preached against homosexuality, not just homosexuality, but I have preached against it. And I have, um, I have taught lessons on it. And I have my own family member come on my page and tell me, 
well, um, that God loves everybody. I have two daughters that's homosexual. And it was my own cousin. And you know what I said to him? I said, I understand you have two daughters that's homosexual. They're my cousins. And I understand they're your daughters and you love them. But just because they're your daughters does not mean that this word of God changes. The word, the, the Bible said Jesus loves them. God loves them, but he loves them enough for them to get it right. And so I, my message doesn't change because it's my family. So this word can never change. The word of God will never change because it's somebody you love, because it's somebody you care about, because it's somebody that's close to you. The message has to remain the same because God does not change his word. His word does not change for everybody, the, anybody. The Bible says he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. The method in which you preach it might change. The method in how you share the gospel may change, but the message itself does not change. Amen. And so it does not change in order to please others. And we have to stand boldly. All right. We have to stand boldly. We cannot stand in fear. We cannot stand um, uh, 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 fidgety and fragile. And, you know, we can't second guess ourselves, but we have to stand and preach the word of God. And when I say preach, I'm not just talking about people that are standing behind the pulpit with license. All of us are preachers. All of us have been called to minister. All right. We might not have a license, but we're called to minister and to evangelize and to share the word of God. And so we must preach and teach the word of God honestly and not deceitfully. We have to teach the word of God honestly, excuse me, and not deceitfully. So in other words, we're not preaching the word of God so that we can get money from people, trick them. We're not, we're not going to preach the gospel so that we can, so that we can get what we want from them, but we have to do it from an honest place and not a deceitful place. De um, when I say deceitfully, I'm meaning not to dilute the word. Okay. We cannot water the word down. All right. We cannot water the word down. And so a lot of people and, and that's where I have problems with a lot of people. A lot of people would say not a lot of people, but there has been times in ministry where um, people have not liked me because I'm straightforward. I'm bold. Um, I'm, I'm blunt. Um, I've learned to have to have tact a little bit. But when we when we read the gospel, if you guys really read the word of God in its full context, Jesus was nice. Jesus loved them. And there was times when Jesus did speak in parables and he was very, um, he was very uh, compassionate. But at the same time, Jesus flipped tables. Jesus called them fools. Jesus, look, Jesus went in on them. He didn't play with them. And so we're living in a time when, when Jesus is coming back. Look, he's coming back sooner today than he was yesterday. And so we cannot play with people. People are losing their lives. People are dying in sin. People are going to hell every day. And so we are responsible for getting this word out. And if it means that I have to tell you the truth with no chaser, then that's what I have to do. And so I'm that type of person. And so we cannot water this gospel down to make people feel okay. The Bible says, look, if you sin and you live in sin and you live an unrepented life and you don't choose God, you're going to hell. I'm not watering that down. No, you don't go in no grave and you don't get no opportunity for your ancestors to come back and pray you through and, to, you know, you don't get a second opportunity at life once you die. Once you die, if you did not live in Christ, if you were not saved, if you did not repent, hell will be your home. I don't care if it's my mama. I tell her the same thing. Even my children, I'm telling them today at 18 and 16, son, you're accountable. You know the word of God. I've raised you. You know what to do. You know how to live. You know how to pray. And so if you do not live right, if you die today and you're not right with God, which thank God he had rededicated his life and he's saved as of today. But if he was not to rededicate his life, I even tell my own children, hell will be your home. As your mother, I don't want you to go to hell. I want to rejoice knowing that the day that you leave this earth, if I'm still living, prayerfully, I go first. But I want to be able to rejoice knowing that you were made it to heaven. OK, so we cannot water it down. We cannot adulterate it. OK, we cannot adulterate the word of God. One thing we should take from Paul in this lesson is Paul did not preach a concealed or a corrupt gospel. He did not hide the gospel and he did not corrupt it. And so we are to we are to take that same example. We cannot corrupt the word of God. We cannot hide the word of God. Why are we hiding it? If we've been called to share the word of God, then we have to share it. We have to get it out there. We have to come outside of our place of hiding and we have to get the word of God out, okay? We have to get the word of God out. And so let's keep going. So we find now that many believers of Christ are failing because we know 
um, the true gospel, but we have began to add things to the word to make it more appealing. You'll find that nowadays there are a lot of people that add to the word of God to make it appealing. Okay, we cannot add to the word of God to make it appealing, thinking that it would cause the word of God to be more effective, but it's not going to be more effective if you glam it up. It's not going to be more effective if you put on a show. It's effective just as it is. As you read the word of God, the effectiveness is already there. Why? Because God said it. And so it's effective within itself. But instead, what we do, um, uh, we do what Paul insisted he would never do, which was handle the word of God deceitfully. And so Paul, he preached an honest gospel and he preached the gospel with integrity. Today, there's a lot of people that don't have integrity. We have to have integrity when we preach the word of God. He knew that what he preached would find approval in the conscience of every man and that he was right in the sight of God. How many of you, and I'm not saying you per se, but you, well, how many know that you are actually, you are right with God right now. You are in right standing with God. So when you share this word of God, you have to make sure that you are in right standing with God so that when you teach and what you release from your mouth and when you're in the street witnessing and you're trying to win your family members and strangers and people that you come in contact with, that you're not distorting um, or that you're not tainting the word of God through a filter um, in your mouth or through the, through this filter here because of sin that's in your life because sin can cause you to uh taint or uh or um corrupt the word of god as you're teaching it so you have to make sure that you're in right standing now am i saying that you have to be perfect when you share the word of god no i'm not saying that i'm not saying that you have to that you know you're not gonna have some issues in your life i'm not saying that see yeah and that's what i'm talking about april so you, i'm not saying you have to be perfect we all we all go through things, but what I'm saying is you cannot live a corrupt life. If you're, if you are, if you are striving and if you are trying to live right and you are doing the best within your ability, that's one thing, but you just, you cannot be lukewarm. Remember we talked about the lukewarm church in revelations. You cannot be lukewarm. You can't have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. And then you are trying to be a witness because people are going to be looking at your lifestyle. All right. And so, um, he's preached with integrity. He knew that what he preached would find approval in the conscience of every man, okay? And so he was right with God. And so let's look at verse three through four. Verses three through four. The good news is revealed. First, let me read it so you guys know where we at. Verses three through four. It says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Remember we talked about a while back, and I think a few of you have asked me about the mysteries of the gospel, right? What are the mysteries? Well, the thing is, there are certain things, or really the word itself, people that are in darkness will never be able to understand the word like those of us who walk in the light, all right? The gospel will be hid to those who are lost. That's verse three. It says it right here. If you are lost, you are spiritually blind, and so therefore you will not be able to hear. You will not be able to receive. You will not be able to understand the revelation, and that's how you can have multiple people that read the same word but get different interpretations because if you're not in God, you're not going to have the revelation that God intended for you to have when it pertains to this gospel. All right. You're going to see it from a carnal eye. You're going to see it from a from a fleshly stance versus from the spirit. OK, so but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world, who is the God of this world, Satan, in whom the God of this world, he has blinded the minds of them which believe not. So people who are unbelievers, people that have not accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, people that operate and in, in, in walk in sin willfully, Satan has blinded their minds. So they cannot comprehend the word of God. So even when you're trying to teach, that's why we don't combat and we don't, we, we're not supposed to argue and debate the word of God. Why are we debating the word of God and arguing over the word of God when it comes to a sinner or someone who does not know the word because they're, they're already blinded. So our prayer should be, Lord, first of all, open up their hearts to be able to receive you open up their hearts that they'll receive salvation so that this word can be ministered to them from the perspective in which God would have us to see this word, all right? And so in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of this glorious gospel. So this gospel, the word of God, the Bible, that the word of Jesus Christ, that is the word, that is the light, okay? The word is the light. Lest this light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. This light 
should shine unto them. You are the light. You are the light of the world, all right? And you, the light that's in you that comes from Christ Jesus should exuberate from you amongst darkness. So the people, the sinners, those who are not in Christ, those who are unbelievers should be able to see the light of God exuberating from you. And so let's let's take let's go a little further with that. And so verses three through four, the good news is revealed to everyone. We understand that. The good news is revealed to everyone. This Bible, this word, the word of God is available to any person that wants it. The word of God is available to any person that wants it, except to those who refuse to believe. Except to those who refuse to believe. Satan is the God of this world. His work is to deceive everybody. Satan's work is to deceive us. And he has blinded those who don't believe in Christ. Satan has blinded them, literally. And so um, the lure of money, power, and pleasure blinds people to the light of Christ. Those who reject Christ and follow their own pursuit have unknowingly made Satan their God. And so what I'm doing is I'm helping you understand the unbeliever. So then you can understand how to witness and how to um, how to share the gospel when it comes to you actually talking to an unbeliever. All right. And see, if people do not respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ, guess what? If you go out and you minister to someone and you know they're lost, whether it's somebody in your family, a friend, a neighbor, or, or even a stranger, if you take the time out to minister to a person um, or you take the time out to minister the gospel, all right, to share the word of God with them and they don't respond or they don't receive you, it is not your fault. It's not your fault and it's really not your responsibility to chase them. Did you know that? It is not your fault and it's not your responsibility to chase them. According to the text, right? According to the Bible, he that believes not on Jesus Christ is a lost man. The Bible says a lost man. God has lost you. You are not his servant. And I'm talking about those who are lost. The church has lost you. You are uh, that particular person, the person that's not saved. They are working um, or not working for the truth. The world has lost that person, okay? And so they yield, um, No, there is no lasting um, service to operating and to uh, 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 colliding and becoming one with the world. And so in other words, that person has lost their self um, to joy. They have lost themselves to the right to heaven. They have lost themselves to the right to the relationship with God if they choose not to believe and if they choose not to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. All right. It's not only that that person who the unbeliever um, will be lost, but also they will be they will be cast into the lake of fire if they choose not to receive Christ. And so John 3, 19, let's write that down. Somebody can put it in comments if you want. I want to read it. I didn't actually put the scripture in here, but I'm gonna go to it real quickly. John 3 and 19. So you know what I'm talking about. John 3, 19. It says this. It says, and this is the condemnation that the light is coming to the world and men loved darkness, men loved darkness rather than light because why? Their deeds were evil. And so John three nineteen talks about the light coming into the world and men loving darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. So Satan is not fully, listen to this. I want to share this with you. Satan is not fully the blame for you or anybody else you know being lost. We like to blame Satan for everything. Everything that doesn't go right in our life, we blame Satan. Everything that happens in our life, we blame Satan if it's not good. Every, anytime somebody's completely lost, we blame Satan. But Satan is not fully to blame for anyone being lost because it isn't until, listen to this, it is not until a person chooses darkness that he then steps into the work to make sure that you stay blinded. So in other words, Satan doesn't make you go into darkness. But when you open the door to darkness for Satan to come in, then Satan comes in and then it's his job and he does it very well to come in and to make sure that you stay blinded to the light and salvation of Jesus Christ. Do we understand that? So Satan don't make you do anything. He might tempt you, but he don't make you do anything. You make a conscious choice 
to operate in sin, to walk into sin, to open the door to sin. And then when you do that, you have just given the enemy um, right. You have just given the enemy, remember from this class, legal right to come into your life. And then once you have given him legal right, everything is fair game. And then he comes in to blind you, to keep you blinded and to keep you away from salvation. Okay. And so not only is your spiritual, this is what happens, okay, when Satan comes in, when you open the door for him, not only is your spiritual sight blinded, because remember, we're not talking about the natural eye, we're talking about spiritual, everything that we do in Christ outside of the natural outreach and minister and all of that, everything else is spiritual, so not only is your spiritual sight blinded, but then he said that the minds of the unbeliever are blinded as well. So now you're telling me my eyes are blinded to be able to see in the spirit, to be able to see the revelation of the word, to be able to see the mysteries of the word of God. But now even comprehending it, to be able to comprehend, to be able to think on the things of the spirit, my mind is now blinded to those things when I have allowed the enemy to come in. Wow. And so Satan is working, of course, on the heart and emotions. So after he comes in and he blinds you spiritually, he blinds your mind, then he begins to work on the heart and the emotions of the loss, okay? But his main battle, this is what I want y'all to understand, and I need to add this to my deliverance training because this is good. But what I want you guys to understand tonight is the main battleground of the enemy is what? Can anybody tell me? What is the main battleground? What does he want outside of your soul? He wants your mind. Yeah, that's right, April, your mind. That is the main battleground. Remember, the soulish realm is your mind, your will, and your emotions. He's okay with having your emotions. He's okay with your will, but he wants your mind. Because remember, the mind of a person is just like the engine of a vehicle. If I take the engine out of a car, that car cannot function without an engine. It just cannot. It cannot function without a motor. And so your mind is the motor of your body, but also um, the, the Bible says, look, it says, do not, do not let the enemy get a foothold. If you give him a foothold, if you give him an inch, he's running rampant. So listen, Satan is strategizing hard on how he can make you think less and learn less. <laughs> he's working hard. He's strategizing. He has come up with a vision. All right, the Bible said, write the vision and make it plain. Satan has come up with a vision. He has come up with a strategy on how to make you think less and learn less. He wants you to use your mind as less as possible. And so that's why it's important for you to keep your mind on God. Keep your, the Bible says, keep your mind, what he'll keep your mind in perfect peace. And so you got to keep your mind on God so it can be in perfect peace. And so this is the very reason why God has chosen the word to transmit the gospel, because the word does what? What does the word do? It touches our minds. The word of God touches our minds so it can touch the minds of the ones who are blind and in darkness. The word of God touches our minds. And so see, Satan is the God of this age because God knew that he would be the popular choice. God knew that Satan would be the popular choice. He is the prince of the world, but guess who's king? God is king. So he still has the final say so. But if you're tired of having your mind blinded by the word of blinded by the God of this world or the God of this age, then you must learn to put your trust in Jesus, who is what? Who is what? God of this world. You have to put your trust in who Jesus is and also what he did for you. So we can't focus strictly on demons. We can't focus strictly on the demonic. We can't focus, focus strictly on warfare, but we have to also put our mind and our trust in who Jesus is and what he did for us. We have to constantly remind ourselves what Jesus did for us, who he is in our life. Okay, we gotta set our thing, we gotta set our mind upon those things which are good, which are pure, okay? And so Satan can only blind those who do not believe. And so if there's any area in your life where there's doubt that leaves open the room or opens up a door for Satan to blind you. If there's any doubt in your life, it opens a door for Satan to come in and blind you. All right. 
And so once you begin to trust God, then Satan can no longer blind you. So if you're blind in any area when it comes to the word of God, if you're struggling in any area when it comes to the word of God, begin to ask God to help you trust him. Ask God to help you trust him, trust his word, trust his ways, trust his promises, trust the purpose that he has for you and your life. All right. Um, in order, in order for the glory of Christ to shine on you, in order uh, to see the same glory that happened in Paul's life, you must be saved. And I know I'm talking to a bunch of saved people, but I'm trying to help you understand how the enemy comes in and also how to witness to other people. So now that we understand Satan's tactic, okay, we understand his tactic, which is what? To blind us, uh, we should now have a strategy. We have to now develop a strategy as Christians on how to pray for our lost loved ones because that's the whole goal there. We want to be able to pray for the our lost loved ones, our lost family members, our friends, and even strangers. We need to be able to learn. We have to set a strategy. We have to put a plan, a goal, a strategy in place on how to, um, how to pray even for those who do not believe. We need to ask God to shine his light on them, and then we need to bind the blinding work of Satan. So for those of you who are asking me, well, you know what? I have family members that, you know, it seems like the enemy is just wrecking havoc in their life and they don't believe in God. Okay, well, your first strategy is not to go in casting out demons or fighting them and, you know, going off on them. The first strategy is to do what? Pray. That's the first strategy. You need to pray. And then you need to, after you pray or as you're praying, then you need to be asking God to shine his light upon that person. OK, so that they can so that God can make room for an opportunity for you to be able to minister to them, that the light of God will shine upon them so that the blinding work of Satan will be removed. All right. We should be asking God to give faith to those who are faithless. In order for them to overcome the unbelief that has invited in the blinding of the devil. So those that we know that are that are um, sinners or that do not believe, we need to be having praying that there will be faith, that faith will be given to them because they are faithless, okay? And so Paul knew, Paul knew what he was talking about when he wrote this text. He was also completely, listen to this, Paul was also completely blind to the truth. Paul was blind to the truth as well until God broke through the darkness that was in his life. Do y'all remember that on the road of the, uh, the Damascus road? And so in fact, Acts 9, 1 through 19, um, that's a lot to read in one little time, one little bit of time. But if you go back and read it, Acts 9, chapter 9, verses 1 through 19, it tells us that when Paul first encountered Jesus, the Lord struck him. Did y'all know this? The Lord struck Paul with blindness. Paul was literally struck with blindness so much to the point that after he was struck with blindness, the Lord came back and actually healed him. The Lord come back, came back and healed him. So Jesus struck him. The Lord struck Paul with blindness and then turns around and heals him after he struck him with blindness. So everything is not the devil. Everything is not the devil. There is a purpose in everything that, there is a purpose in or for everything that happens to us. And so it says that um, after he was struck with blindness, he was then healed and his eyes, after he was healed, his eyes both were then spiritually and physically open so that he could see the glory of God. So what if, this is a big what if, but what if God chose to blind you so that he could then open your eyes to what was greater? My God. What if, what if God chose to allow something to come upon you uh, 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 or a deformity or, or, and I'm not, I'm not saying wishing anything on you guys, but any chance, but there's some people who are in these situations. They're like, well, I'm going through this stuff. Why am I going through? And I've shared with people before it's for the glory of God. And they're like, but you mean to tell me God's going to get glory out of me going through? You mean to tell me God's going to get glory because I'm going through this situation? You mean to tell me God's going to get glory and I'm, I'm having pain in my head and, and I, and I'm being demonized and I'm being attacked and I'm going through warfare and my husband is fighting against me and my kids won't listen. And you know, I, I, you mean to tell me that God's going to get glory out of this? Yes. Everything that happens is for the glory of God. It may not look like it because you're going through it, but when you come out of it, it's for the glory of God. And so even Paul being struck with blindness at that point in time, I'm sure Paul being blind didn't think, well, this is going to bring glory to God. 
No, I'm sure he was like, what? I'm blind. Why would you do this? Why would you take my eyesight? This is messed up. This is jacked up. How am I going to be able to talk to the people? How am I going to be able to travel? How am I going to be able to do this and that? Well, remember, Paul was a murderer. Paul was ruthless. Paul was hood, okay? He did not care, but Jesus or the Lord allowed him to be blinded so that in return, God would get the glory out of his life. And look, look what happened after his Damascus Road experience, God began to get the glory. He actually became, he went from being a murderer to an apostle. Come on, somebody. And so, so he healed him both. Uh, that's right. He hated Christianity. That's right, Elvira. And so um, he, uh, the Lord healed his eyes both spiritually and physically, and they were open so that he could see the glory of God. Okay, we're going to go to 2 Corinthians. Well, you guys are probably there, but 2 Corinthians, let me get back to it. Um, 2 Corinthians 4. And so verse 5 through 6 says this, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so in other words, we do not go around, listen to this, we do not go around preaching about ourselves. When we preach, the message is not supposed to be about ourselves. We're not supposed to glorify ourselves. We're not supposed to highlight ourselves. We're not supposed to put ourselves on a pedestal, okay? But instead, we are supposed to preach only Christ Jesus. We're only supposed to preach Christ Jesus. The only thing we are to say about ourselves is that we are what? Servants of the people of God, all right? We are only supposed to share and to preach and to teach that we are servants of the people of God because of what Jesus has done for us. All right, that's right. We can testify. And so the focus of Paul's preaching was always Christ and not himself. He never preached about himself. He didn't preach about his cash. He didn't preach about his cars and neither did he preach about his cribs. And I know they didn't have cars back then. So he didn't preach about his donkeys. All right, he preached about Jesus Christ. And so when we as believers witness, we are to tell people about what Christ has done. That's right. Testimony, what Christ has done and not about our own personal abilities and not our, about our own accomplishments. And so your number one priority is to introduce people to Christ always, not us. So that's why I put up a statement the other day on Facebook. The church has become professionals at inviting people to church but when was the last time you invited someone to christ when was the last time you introduced them to christ because oftentimes we'll say hey do you go to church oh you need to come to my church well are we highlighting church or are we highlighting christ because i'm here to tell you christ ain't at every church and so we have to get busy we have to get back on the ball we have to get back in position of inviting people to christ leading them to christ leading them to salvation and not leading them to a building not leading them to us well girl you ought to come to church because honey i'm preaching this sunday and i can preach good honey you know hey i can hoop real good honey yeah i'm singing today honey you need to you know we're not leading people to us because we don't want people to see us because we filthy anyway we've only been made clean by his righteousness we're wretched it's by the grace of God that we're able to do and say what we do. But we need to lead people to Christ because Christ is the only person that can help them. Christ is the only person that can truly save them. Amen. And so we don't need to introduce people to nobody else but Christ. Paul willingly, he willingly served the Corinth church, even though the people must have deeply disappointed him. Serving people, we have to understand, requires a sacrifice of time. Do y'all know how much time I sacrificed? And I was saying to myself, that I was like, Lord, I'm tired, but it's a sacrifice, okay? Serving people is a sacrifice, but I want you to understand tonight that the sacrifice does not go unnoticed. It is not in vain that God will honor your sacrifice. When you, anything that you do for the kingdom of God, God will honor it, okay? And so serving people requires a sacrifice of time and personal desire. Sometimes you have to set aside your own agenda. You have to set aside your own desires, your own wants, your own needs for the, for the sake of the kingdom, for Christ's sake, okay? To be able to serve. And so being Christ's follower, being a follower of Christ means serving others even when they don't measure up to our expectations. Ooh, that, that's hard for us. 
you know, because us, not us per se, but Christians, believers of Jesus Christ, oftentimes we only want to serve when it's convenient for us. We only want to serve or do what the word says when people are lining up um, according to our expectations, when they are doing what we have asked them to do, when they look like we look, when they talk like we talk, when, you know, when it's familiar. But what about when people don't line up to our expectations? What about when people are not living the way that we feel like they should live? Does that mean that we're not supposed to serve them? No, because even Jesus served. He even sat with the drunks and he sat with those who were liars and all of that, not because he sat with them for company. He didn't sit with them to kick it and to chill. He didn't sit with them to party, but he sat with them so that he could teach them, that he could pour into them, that they one day would come to the acknowledgement of who he was. All right. And so beware, we have to be aware of people who often preach and teach about themselves rather than Christ. If you find a ministry or a part of a ministry or you connect to people who are teaching the word of God or just teaching anything and they highlight themselves, they glorify themselves and you don't hear them talk about Christ often. They don't give the glory to Christ. They don't honor Christ. They don't lift him up. They don't esteem him, but it's more so about who is about them themselves and them, you know, uh, me, myself and I, then you need to run. All right, because they're building their personal platform and not building a platform for Christ. All right, and so let's keep going. So Paul always made Jesus the focus of his ministry. That is why in this scripture, he is able to tell us not to preach nothing else but Christ. It's not wrong to share your testimony. It's not even wrong to joke, okay? And when I say joke, like, you know, a lot of times um, we'll share different stuff when we're ministering and um, try to highlight funny stuff and all of that. It's okay to do that stuff, but in that, the focus should always remain around Christ, not ourselves. When Paul did present or talk about himself, it was never as Lord. He never represented himself as a Lord. He never represented himself as a master or as someone who was superior over others or a God, but simply he represented himself as a servant for Jesus Christ's name, for Jesus sake name. And so that's even when people, do y'all know there's people that uh, often in my inbox or message me and, you know, they try to uh, esteem me high and, you know, oh my God, I just love you. You know, you're this, you're that, you're that. And, and the only thing I can say to them is, is by the grace of God, I'm humble. It's, you know, I have to remain humble because God can snatch us down at any time. He can take those gifts away from us at any time. He can take those talents. He can take that word. He can, you know, God can, God has a way of humbling us. And so that's why we have to remain humble at all times. And I understand that I'm nobody, I'm nothing. Without him, I can't live, move, breathe. I don't have no being without him. And so it's in him that I move, I live. And I do everything that I do. And even through the teachings, even through the deliverance, it's his strength, okay? It's his peace. All of that is because of him. And so we have to remain humble servants, okay? We have to remain humble servants. And so I want you to remember that those of you who are, um, who are sharing the gospel, who are teaching, if the Lord decides to use you or when he uses you um, in other arenas of ministry, whether it be any type of platform that you create, that the Lord leads you to create, whether it's stuff out in the community, whether it's in your church, internationally, locally, whatever, always remain humble and remember that it's God that's doing the work and you're just a vessel that he uses. Remember his will, not our will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay. Also notice this, Paul always served others for Jesus's sake. It was always to please Christ and not man. And so everything that Paul did, it was to please Christ. So we are not, we are not doing what we do to please another person. All right. We are doing what we do. We have to make sure my goal is not, I might step on your toes. If I'm preaching the word of God, I'm okay with it. As long as it's not in my flesh, as long as it's not me. And if the word that I preach and it's the unadulterated word of God and it steps on your toes, I'm okay with that. Why? Because I want to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Now I'm going to make you ruler over many. And so I'm not preaching to make people happy. And a lot of times when you're like that and, you, and you're not one of those preachers that just preach stuff to tickle people's ears, you're not going to have a lot of following. You're not going to have a lot of people. And I'm okay with that. If I can reach one person, if I can affect the life of uh, uh, one person and they change their life, I'm good. I've done what I've been called to do, okay? And so see, Paul served the God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. And so what it is, 
Um, so what is what was Paul teaching us in these last few verses here that we just read? Paul is saying the Lord God who created light in the physical world can then fill your heart with spiritual light. So the same God that spoke in Genesis and said, let there be light and there was, that's the same God. He can take that same uh, uh, light that he created in the physical and he can actually create and fill your heart with a spiritual light. All right. Even if you are blinded by the God of this age, Satan's work of blinding is great. So you might know a person that's blinded by the light of this age or by the God of this age, by Satan. They may be physically blind or spiritually blind by the enemy. But know this, even though he can do that, God's work of bringing light is greater. God's power is greater. All right. God's strength, his ability is greater. So there's nothing that Satan can do to you that God cannot outdo, that he cannot overturn, that he cannot reverse, that he cannot, uh, that he cannot esteem or come above. All right. Paul believed Genesis one and three. Paul believed Genesis one and three, where God created light with a command. He said, let there be light. There was a command. And from that command, the Bible says there was light. And so when Paul was on the Damascus road um, on his way to persecute, Paul was on his way, like Elvira said, Paul was on his way to persecute and kill Christians. He said in the word of God, you read that suddenly there was a light shone around him from heaven. Suddenly there was a light. I'm here to tell you tonight that when the light shows up, darkness has to go. So anything in your life where there's darkness present, if you are if you are a light carrier, if you are the carrier of God's glory, if you're the carrier of God's light, when you show up, darkness has to go. Your family may be in turmoil. But when you show up, it has to go. If you're a glory carrier, if you're a glory carrier, if you're a, if you're a carrier of the light of Jesus Christ, it has to flee. When you're going through things in your personal life, when you begin to uh, when you begin to read, when you begin to invite Holy Spirit in, when you begin to invite worship in, when you begin to invite praise in, the enemy has to flee, darkness has to flee, depression has to flee, anxiety has to flee, all of the works of the enemy has to flee. OK, and so when Paul was on the Damascus road and then he said suddenly there was a light shone around him from heaven. This was Paul's first encounter with Jesus. It was his very first encounter. So every believer should have a shining heart. Our light should be so bright that they see us, other people, people that we come in contact with, unbelievers. They see us through. Uh, they see Christ through us because why? Because he lives in us. And so let's keep going. Okay, so because he lives in us, so we might ask what exactly has God shown in our hearts? It is the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, all right? So the knowledge of the glory of God is a light. Every Christian should have some knowledge of the glory of God. God gives us the light of the knowledge of God and when we and we have the responsibility to get it out. So as he gives us the knowledge, we have the responsibility to, in return, get it out, all right? He shined it in so that we could shine it out, all right? I hope I'm helping somebody. God has given us, he didn't give it to us for us to be stingy. He didn't give it to us so that we could hog it all. The purpose of us getting it is so we can turn around and give it back, all right? So I'm gonna say that again. He shined his light in us so that we could shine the light out of us instead of shining it on us as some Christians seem to do so much. He wants to, um, other Christians or people that are, are trying to take the glory of God or try to highlight themselves. Oftentimes they want to keep it all to themselves. He says, I, this is what he says. He says, I'll shut the curtains so that none of this light gets out and puts himself back into darkness. So when we try to hoard up the light within ourselves, we will certainly lose it. So if we try to keep all of this stuff obtained or retained on the inside, we'll end up losing it because what we've done is we took the light and we have shut it up in darkness. When we cut the lights off, darkness appears. When we cut the lights on, darkness disappears. Verse seven. Verse seven. Verse seven says this. It says, but we have, this is where we're going, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. There's a treasure in the earthen vessel that the excellency of the power of God, um, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. 
Let me say that again. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us, that the power may be of God and not of us. So, but this precious treasure, um, this light and power that now shines within us is held in perishable containers. That is in our own weak bodies. So everyone can see that our glorious power is from God and not our own. The valuable message of salvation in Jesus Christ has been entrusted by God to frail and uh, valuable human beings. And so think about it. All of this power is inside of these weak bodies. All of this power, all of this light, all of this stuff God has entrusted. So it's a treasure. All of this stuff that God has entrusted us with is called a treasure. He has entrusted his treasure within us in these perishable containers because one day this stuff is going to fall away. This stuff is going to diminish. This even now, you know, we're, we're nothing without him. You know, we're, we're without him, we're just jacked up, but he's entrusting all of that within us. And so Paul focuses, however, uh, his focus, however, was not on the perishable container. So it's not merely on the body. It's not merely on the person, but on its priceless contents the contents within the perishable container. So God's power dwelling in us, that's what that was the focus, his power that dwells in us. Though we are weak, God uses us to spread his word. He uses us, he uses um, not only us to spread his word, but the good news also, he uses us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ and he gives us power to do his work. So he gives us power to spread the word. He gives us power to do his work. What is the word? Uh, laying hands on the sick and they shall recover, casting out demons, preaching and teaching the word of God, all right? Going and visiting the sick and the elderly, the widows, taking care of them. He uses us and gives us power to do the work. So knowing that the power is his and it's not ours should keep us from pride and it should motivate us to keep daily contact with God. So that means without him, we're nothing. So we have to communicate with him daily through prayer, through, through worship, through intercession. We have to keep that uh, communication line open. And then knowing that the work um, and the power, knowing all of this stuff comes from him, it should keep us motivated, all right? And it should keep us from pride, all right? And so our responsibility is to let people see God through us at all times. That's why we have to be careful and we have to control our emotions. We can't be all emotional out here as Christians. We can't just be cussing folk out, going off on people, flipping out because we mad. We have to learn how to contain and how to control our emotions, how to control our mouth, how to control what we do and what we say. And we have, we have to bring ourselves under subjection because if we're out here acting any kind of way, people are not going to want the Christ that we speak of. How is people going to want a loving God when the people that are sharing God don't act loving? They're not loving. They're not peaceful. They, they're not, they don't have any joy. You know, if, if we are exemplifying everything outside of God's characteristics, then it's going to be hard for us to lead people to Christ. It's going to be hard for our, our light to shine when there's so much darkness on the inside. And so isn't it, but it, this is the thing though, isn't it amazing that God chose to put his treasure into us? He could have put it in the animals. He could have put it into the trees, but he decided to put it into us. Those of us that were made after his image, we were made after his likeness. He considers us his pots of clay. And so who is uh, worthy to be a container for God's light and glory? The smallest person isn't smart enough. The purest person isn't pure enough. The most spiritual person isn't spiritual enough. And the most talented person isn't talented enough. We are all just clay pots holding on or holding in an unspeakable great treasure. That sounds good to me. We are all just clay pots holding unspeakable great treasure. And see, earthenware vessels were common in every home in the ancient world. They were not very durable compared to metal and they were useless if broken because glass could be melted down again, right? They were cheap and of little value, but someone once said God chose to put his light and glory in the everyday dishes and not in the fine china. Think about that. Like everyday dishes is kind of like plasticware and all of that other stuff. You might have some plastic bowls and, and we don't, because we don't pull out fine china all the time, only when we have special guests, but the Lord chose to put us in, and he chose to characterize us or, uh, or uh, uh, identify us with pots. 
Because he said what? He said, I'm the potter, you're the clay. And so we almost always are drawn to the thing that has the best packaging, but the best gifts often have the most unlikely packaging. Think about that. Have you ever, during Christmas time, for those who have celebrated Christmas in the past or still celebrate Christmas or have seen Christmas celebrated, or maybe a birthday, whatever the case may be, and or a wedding, say you get, let's use that for a better, uh, well, all of us aren't married. So just say a birthday gift. Say maybe when you were younger and you might've got a gift for your birthday and then you see all these pretty gifts, normally we're attracted to the most the one that's most beautifully wrapped, the one that's wrapped the best, the one that shines the most. We're like, ooh, it's got to be something good in here, right? And so we always go for that one first because if one was just, if I just had a gift and, you know, and I took the gift and I just balled it up and I'm like, happy birthday, y'all, my thing. Okay, happy birthday. You'd be like, what's in there? Ain't nothing in there. Uh, she said the vessel's like styrofoam. I'm like, ain't nothing in there. But I could have a diamond ring in this bag and I just might have didn't have the right thing to wrap it. And I just, and so oftentimes we go for the, we go for the most uh, beautifully packaged gift, but the best gifts often have the most unlikely packaging. I, I often heard people say um, uh, the best good things come in small packages. And so God did not see a need to package Jesus when he came as a man to this earth. Think about it. Jesus was born in a manger. God could have set it up to where he was born in fame and he was born in fortune and he was born in the in the top place and all of that, but he was born in a place called Bethlehem in the manger. So he wasn't packaged well when he came out, but he was the best thing that could have ever been offered to us. Come on, somebody. He was the best thing that could have ever been offered to us. And so Jesus was not embarrassed. He was not embarrassed to live as an earthen vessel. God is not embarrassed to use clay pots like us. So we might not be fine china, but guess what? Fine china, honey, if it breaks up in tiny pieces, you got to turn around and put that thing back in the fire and melt it just for it to be put back, just for you to even try to recreate that thing again. But pots, I put you on the wheel, honey, and throw a little clay on there and spin you around and I, you've been made over again. All right? And so he's not embarrassed to use us. That the excellency, the Bible says that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Why does God put such a great treasure in such weak vessels? That's a good question. Why does God put such a great treasure in such weak vessels? Because we're considered a weak vessel. Even though we have his strength, we're still weak vessels. And so uh, it's so that the greatness of the power may be of God and not of us. Huh. It's to show his power. Because if we're considered weak vessels, but he has so much invested in us, so much power, so much love. All, you know, he, he has entrusted us with so much, so much authority and the ability to do so much is to be able to show that the power is not in us, but it's in him. Because if it was truly us, we're not able to contain nothing that God has given us, but it's through his power and his ability and his love and his grace and his mercy that we're able to obtain and hold all of this, all right? And so that, so that it would be evident to anyone who had eyes to see that the work was being done by the power of God and not by the power of the vessel. So when people look at us, you know, they look at us and say, okay, I'll use me for not to boast, but I'm using me as an example. That's like me back in the world. You know, I'm, I was promiscuous in the world. I was, um, you know, I would go to clubs when I was in the world. I was a bartender in the world. I was a cusser in the world. But now people that knew me then, they can look at me and say, oh, it has to be God. It must be God because she ain't sleeping around. It must be God because she don't go to the clubs no more. It must be God because she's not into that filthy mess that she was into or she don't look like what she was into. And if I can share even some of your testimonies, which I don't know, I'm just paraphrasing, that, hey, they, people look at you from afar and they say, I know it has to be God that changed their life because they used to be on drugs. They used to be in the crack house. They used to be in the horror 
whorehouse. They used to be in the bar. They were laid out, strung out. They was prostitute and they was this, they was that. People had gave up on you, but to see that your life had changed because you were a weak vessel then, but now the power of God, the strength of God, the resurrected power of God has come on the inside of you. And they knew that if it was you alone, you couldn't do it. So it had to be because of God. It had to be because of his strength. It had to be because of his mercy. It had to be because of his grace. Look what the Lord has done. And so people begin to look afar and, and, and then the glory of God, God is then glorified because they can see that the light of God is in you. And they know it had to be God. It had to be God, because if it would have been me on my own, I would have been in a crazy house. I would have been in a sick house. I would have been in my grave somewhere. So it had to be God. So it's, it's him that lives in us and through us and not we ourselves. So that it would be evident to anyone who had eyes to see that the work was being done by the power of God and not by the vessel. Not me, God. But it's you. Yeah. And so you might wonder tonight, why did God choose risky earthen vessels instead of safe? Heavenly ones, because perfect vessels are safe, but they bring only glory to themselves. See, if you was perfect, then the glory would be brought to you because you were already perfect. So that's why God said I had to go grab some people that were not qualified, but I grabbed some people that the world thought wasn't qualified, but I grabbed them and then I qualified them after I called them. I had to go grab some people that was down in the gutter. I had to go grab some people that were broke, busted, and disgusted. I had to go grab some people that were in the whorehouse and in the crack house. And I had to go grab them people because those were the least of them that people thought. And then those are the ones that I was able to pour my glory into. I was able to pour the power, my power into them. And so that the so that when they go out, people would have to bring glory and they would have to say, look, I know this was nobody but God. See, everything that you go through, you might've said, well, God, why did you allow me to go through this? God, why did you allow me to deal with this? Why am I going through this situation? Why am I dealing with this? Why are people talking about me? They're ridiculing me. You know, I didn't fit in. I, uh, all of this other stuff that he said, it was for my glory because you yourself couldn't do it. You yourself couldn't obtain it. But because of my love for you, I allowed you to endure it. And then I brought you out just like I brought Paul out. I brought you out. And now I get the glory out of it. And now I get the glory out of it. And so because perfect vessels are safe, but they bring glory to themselves, earthen vessels are risky, but can bring profound glory to God. So now we get to the best part of this text. We have talked about how Paul preached a more glorious gospel. We talked about why more people don't respond to such a glorious gospel. We talked about Paul preaching to us uh, to preach Jesus and not ourselves. And then Paul shares with us that we are great treasures in such a humble container. But now let's go a little further and look at the suffering. Come on, somebody say suffering, because I know I'm not the only one that has suffered for a little while. But now we look at the suffering in Paul's ministry and how it brought forth life. From this moment on, you're going to understand that your suffering brings forth life. The Bible says that if you suffer with me, you're going to reign with me. If you suffer with me, you're going to reign with me. And so let's look at that. We're going to look at verse eight through 12. It says, we are troubled, my God, on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but somebody ought to flip that butt. Y'all remember that from the, uh, from the Bible study the other night? Somebody ought to flip that butt because it said, yet, we are not in despair. We're persecuted, flip that butt, but not forsaken. We're cast down, flip that butt, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body, the denying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Verse 12, so then death worketh in us, but life in you, my God. So Paul reminds us that though we pay, or I'm sorry, not pay, that though we may think we are at the end of the rope, 
listen to this because I want you to grab this for encouragement tonight. That though we think we're at the end of the rope, we are never, ever, ever at the end of the rope. I want you to tell somebody or tell yourself tonight, I am not at the end of the rope. I am not at the end of the rope. Our perishable body, our perishable body is subject to sin and suffering, but God never abandons us. I don't care how alone you think you are. How alone you think you feel, God will never abandon you unless you just absolutely walk away from him and refuse to come back. Because Christ has won the victory over death. We have eternal life. All of our risks, all of our humiliations, all of our trials are opportunities for Christ to demonstrate his power and presence in us and through us. And can I share something with you tonight? Some of your trials don't look like other people's trials. Some of you will suffer or have suffered for days. Some will suffer for weeks or have suffered for weeks. Some of you, that time frame may look like months and some even years, and some may even look like a lifetime. But know that the suffering brings forth glory to God. And so we have to learn how to go through the suffering. Are you going to murmur and complain or are you going to give God glory? Are you going to murmur and complain or are you going to exalt his name? Are you going to live? Are you still going to honor the word? Are you still going to read? Are you still going to rejoice as if you're not even suffering at all? And so we are hard pressed, the Bible said, yet not destroyed. Another translation says we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. So in other words, we are not broken. Being hard pressed gives the idea of being hunted. Paul was a wanted, hunted man because of what he was for Jesus. In Acts 23, if y'all go back and read that, men conspired together to not eat or drink until they had murdered Paul. So they had went on a sabbatical. They had went on a fast. They, were, they had refused to eat or drink until they killed Paul. They, they were looking for him. His head was wanted. Paul knew what it was like to be hunted. He knew what it was like not to be liked and to live as a, and to live as a wanted, hunted man. It meant what? Terrible stress. He went through lots of stress. They, can you imagine being on the run for your life because of something that God had called you to do? Can you imagine being on the run for your life because you, because you serve Christ and you're speaking the truth? And so, and so yet what happened was he experienced every moment of the day. It was terrible for him. Every moment of the day was terrible for him. Yet Paul was not crushed. crushed he was not crushed by stress. He was still able to serve the Lord gloriously. Uh, my question to you tonight is, can you still serve the Lord even when you don't understand him? Can you trace him or trust him even when you can't trace him? Can you serve him through the difficult times? Can you serve him through the hard times? Can you serve him when you don't understand? Can you serve him through the suffering? The Bible says we are perplexed. We're persecuted. We're struck down, but we do not give up and quit. We are not quitters. If you are a servant of God, if you are a daughter of the most high, if you are a son of the most high, then we are not quitters. We are not in despair. We are not forsaken and neither are we destroyed. Paul's life was hard. Some of you sitting before me under the sound of my voice tonight and those who may catch the replay, your life is hard, was hard, is hard, may be hard. And it was hard because of his passionate devotion to Christ. Sometimes you can be so passionate that the enemy hates you and he will send everybody he possibly can to come against you. But they were after him and it was hard because of his passionate devotion to Christ and to the gospel. But there was triumph. So remember, here we go. We're talking about him being persecuted in despair. I felt like he was forsaken, going through all of this stuff, having a hard life. But the Bible says there was triumph in Paul's life because he knew the power and victory of Jesus. You have to understand that victory belongs to you. There's a song that says that victory belongs to you. The battle has already been won. And so you have to stop looking at yourself from the stance of being a victim and you have to start standing in your authority and in the power of God that you are victorious through Christ Jesus. He has already won it for you. 
So now it's up to you whether you're going to walk into it. He was continually in situations where only the power and victory of Jesus would meet his need. When we talk about suffering like this today, it is easy to think we are just saying spiritual things because most of us live very comfortable lives and do not suffer much at all. Nevertheless, we should remember that everything Paul said about suffering, he said as a man who probably suffered more than you or anyone we ever meet will. Paul went through some suffering, honey. And so this here was not theory, okay? This life, this life of suffering was not theory to Paul, but this was Paul's real life experience. And so in my closing of this Bible study, I want you to know that you are light upon a hill. You are light upon a hill and he has given you a lamp unto your feet. And so everywhere you tread, I declare and decree from this day forward that you will be a light of you will be a light for the kingdom of God. You will be a light of God that God's light will exuberate and will shine amongst you that in your speech there will be light in your characteristics and the way that you carry yourself in business, the way that you carry yourself amongst your family, the way that you carry yourself in ministry, the way that you carry yourself in the grocery store. Remember, because we don't lay down religion. There's no such thing unless you're a religious person. I'm not a religious person. I don't, I don't have religion. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, I'm at the point now where I almost don't really want to say I'm a Christian. I'm a believer of Jesus Christ. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Cause now any nowadays, anybody can be a Christian and you don't have to live in, uh, you don't have to live and have no morals, no standards, no nothing, but I am a believer of Jesus Christ. And so everywhere you go, I'm believing and I'm trusting and I'm encouraging you to let your light shine. Let your light shine. That God may get the glory out of your life. Amen. And so that is the close um, of this Bible study. I pray that you have been blessed. I pray that you have been encouraged. I pray that you have been uplifted. And for the sake of text, um, this is where the joke comes in. Y'all need to learn how to flip that butt. All right, take that butt and flip it out the way, all right? And when we're talking about buts, if y'all know anything about grammar, they used to say conjunction, function, something, 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 move that butt out. And so a lot of times it was, I was this, but, okay, now we need to start, we need to start walking in the power of God. Okay, so I pray you guys were blessed.